greetings everyone i welcome you all again to this very special conversation with mr mark hink the author of focus the asml way inside the power struggle over the most complex machine on the earth so mark is a technology editor at nrc handles led by profession uh, and has been covering the ins and outs of the high technology sector for more than a decade now so mark thank you for doing this and i hope you are doing great well thank you for for having me here love it yes likewise so now before we dive deep into this conversation let me tell my viewers a bit about the book we'll be discussing in this next hour so mm. focus the asml way is one of the most detailed and thorough account of the famous lithography giant asml that designs and manufactures huge photolithography machines almost the size of a city bus and they are used for fabricating the semiconductor chips that we use in our mobile phones in our laptops in our data centers i mean you name it it is there and these machines are an engineering masterpiece since they work at the precision of nanometers and uh, i read the whole book and i could not stop until i finished it uh, and uh, we at geo strata have been covering the ins and outs of the global semiconductor industry for one and a half year now and uh, we could not ask for a better piece of literature than this book so mark again thank you for this and uh, let's start with this conversation wow thanks for this uh, great introduction isha really appreciate it right So your detailed account on ASML's evolution in the focus is capturing everyone's attention. I just watched the video of Asiano Metri where he quoted you, and I was really happy to know about it. Since I I'll be also talking to you, and uh, it really lightened me up. So mm -hmm. could you share the narrative of how ASML emerged and transformed into the key supplier for all the TSMCs, Samsungs, and Intels of the world? Like walk us through your research. Well, if you look back at the history of ASML, uh, the company actually started in nineteen eighty four. But uh, the predecessor for ASML was Philips. So um, back in the days, always uh, already in the early 70s, uh, Philips uh, developed this lithography machine, this core uh, technology that was uh, well actually the foundation of uh, of ASML's uh, technology. And Philips didn't succeed in well getting it, uh, this machine very complex, even in those days, uh, commercially viable. And uh, so they needed a partner to, uh, uh, well, uh, spin off a, a separate company that uh, solely focused on this one machine, this uh, lithography machine. And that company was ASML. So in 84, of the, um, 1984, uh, the company started. And it, um, initially it was uh, targeted, uh, targeting the uh, US companies. Uh, because that's where the, uh, uh, the, the big chip manufacturers uh, used to be. Um, and that's where Silicon Valley got its name, of course. Uh, so um, ASML did, uh, uh, tried its best to uh, even create a headquarters that looked a lot like the buildings in Silicon Valley, just to make a, a bit of a futuristic impression on, on their, uh, well, uh, the customers they, uh, they wanted to, uh, to uh, lure and uh, they had a very rough start because uh, the, the the market for lithography machines, which are the uh, well the, the juggernauts in 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 a in a semiconductor fab, um, was quite crowded. So there were, uh, I think, back in the day, about ten uh, companies building these lithography machines in the U.S., but also in in Japan, of course. And nobody needed another company. But ASML somehow found a way uh, to uh, get the first a couple of customers. Uh, these were U.S. firms, and they uh, were kind of lucky because Philips um, uh, was also investing in the early startup of TSMC, the uh, Taiwanese, uh, well, uh, the yeah. biggest foundry of all uh, uh, of, of all foundries uh, these days. So in '87. The uh, launch of uh, TSMC was backed by Philips, and for ASML, um, it was an opportunity to also uh, deliver these um, uh, machines, these lithography machines, to TSMC, and it was the early start of this foundation, uh, this cooperation between uh, ASML and TSMC uh, that you still see uh, these days. Um, in the meantime, ASML was also expanding in Korea, where the uh, large uh, manufacturers of uh, uh, memory chips uh, were, uh, are based yeah. and uh, they, they uh, uh, managed to uh, get a Samsung a uh, very uh, well tough customer to have but a very important customer to have uh, as a as a new uh, um, client 
and if you look at uh, ASML these days, so uh, uh, in uh, in this century, then you see that these three companies are still the most important uh, customers. That's uh, TSMC, Samsung, and Intel, and of course uh, th there are a couple of other uh, uh, companies as well. So, so for my research uh, process, I spoke to the early founders of ASML, and they uh, they, they they told me these crazy stories about the early days, how they uh, well. Uh, were sneaking into uh, the uh, fabs of customers to uh, uh, adjust their machines in secret so they could uh, uh, win these beauty contests, uh, we, uh, which were very important because ASML was not a well-known company uh, back in the day. And they had to impress uh, the, the customers to try to acquire. You was a new kid in the block, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, 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 they snuck into, uh, to, uh, I think it was AMD's factory. and. Actually, they went. Uh, they won the the beauty con contest because they were having trouble uh, um, uh, with some some of the parts of the of the lithography machine, and in the end, they won the contract, and uh, that kind of rescued the company. And if you look back at the early uh, days of uh, ASML, it was often on the brink of collapse uh, until uh, I, I think in the nineties. Then uh, the the company was a. Uh, a bit more secure and that's also the time uh, when they IPO'd and uh, the, 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 it was a relatively safe uh, uh, safe investment so to speak. Right. So uh, in your book you have mentioned that the whole lithography machine can be divided into three parts and I talked to an executive at ASML uh, last February on this podcast. He mentioned that ASML is more of a system integrator rather than a monolithic manufacturer or an equipment manufacturer. So like there are three main components, if I'm not wrong, there is a stepper, there is a stage and there is a laser phase. So how does this work? Like uh, if I want to just remove the stepper, I can change it with something else or how does that work? How does a machine work like that? Well, it... Um... I'd be too far-fetched to explain how a lithography machine works in detail. But if you look at the, the building blocks, you could compare it to Lego, uh, you know, the, 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 the yeah. toys from, from Denmark, the plastic toys. And um, uh, so ASML has divided its system in several modules. And um, these are uh, uh, integrated or are built at uh, uh, several suppliers. So not at the company itself, the design, and the total design is, of course, the responsibility of ASML itself. But um, all these parts are being outsourced to uh, to suppliers, and they have to build uh, these modules so they stick uh, can be put together later on. And um, if you compare that, for example, to the leading um, lithography makers uh, back in the day, which were uh, Canon and, and Nikon, these are integrated uh, companies. Um, uh, if you look at their other uh, products like copiers or uh, digital cameras, these have all the basic components, also a light source and, 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 and lenses and a moving table um, and to, uh, uh, well, the, the, the same ingredients you need to build a lithography. If you look at ASML, it was forced because it was a startup. It didn't have any uh, own technology, hardly any own technology. It was forced to uh, source uh, very important parts, very important modules, like the basic uh, Lego uh, building blocks, yeah. to uh, to other companies. And one of the companies uh, uh, they started with uh, was the, the most uh, crucial ingredient, which is the optics system, because uh, uh, you need lenses. Nowadays, you need mirrors that reflect uh, the uh, uh, the light source. But um, back in the eighties, you need needed lenses to uh, well, uh, guide the, the, the trajectory of the laser. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, so Zeiss is a very important partner, but also other companies from the Netherlands uh, um, made it possible that ASML uh, got to outsource, well, 80% of the value of, their, of its uh, systems. And um, that makes it a company that's quite light on its feet. Um, if you compare it to Nikon and Canon. So uh, every time there was a, uh, well, a downturn in, in the chip industry, uh, the uh, competitors, of, uh, competitors of ASML were kind of reluctant to invest in R&D because uh, um, they, they had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, capital to lose. And ASML was uh, quite light on its feet. So the, these uh, outsourced uh, product line uh, 
or it's outsourced uh, system. The suppliers. Yeah, yeah, it's a system of supplies really helped them to uh, uh, to them. gain market share and in every down uh, uh, during every downturn because they kept their R and D uh, levels high and that kind of um, helped uh, ASML's market share grow and grow and grow. Right. So since you are you talked about the suppliers, uh, before I read this book, I wasn't aware of the intricate dynamics that are between the ASML and its suppliers. So ASML is kind of very demanding with its suppliers. And uh, I mean, for the right reasons as well, I understand. But sometimes I feel that this often leads to the conglomerates, uh, you know, acquiring their suppliers in such cases. And sometimes those are just hostile, uh, uh, let's just say, there are hostile negotiations within the boardrooms, and uh, at the end of it, uh, the supplier loses its autonomy and becomes a part of the larger company. But somehow, mm -hmm. the suppliers of ASML have maintained kind of an autonomy, uh, and they are away from ASML in kind of their corporate governance. So how does that work? Well, uh, it, it feels, uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, uh, it feels kind of counterintuitive to see that uh, you have these uh, very crucial parts of your machine that you uh, outsource. But if you look at the model uh, of ASML, you could uh, compare to the uh, 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 to the uh, airplane industry. So um, if you look how, how you build an airplane, then there's this uh, system integrator on top of it, Boeing or Airbus, but they source, uh, source out every uh, uh, important part, like the, the, the motor or, or, or the... the uh, the chairs, or you name them, the wings, every part is uh, being outsourced. And so uh, the, the model of ASML is very, uh, you could compare it with that, with the... Uh, uh, with an airplane. What's a, yeah, with, with an airplane. But what, what, what's the industry called? Help me out there. Aviation industry. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a word. So mm -hmm. you could compare uh, ASML's model to the aviation industry. And uh, uh, that makes it very easy to uh, uh, outsource uh, these parts. Um, but uh, ASML has also uh, acquired uh, some of their uh, suppliers, but only uh, at a time when they weren't able to, uh, well, take care of themselves. <laughs> so, uh, um, so one of these uh, ex uh, strategic uh, acquisitions was uh, Symer, um, which was a laser. Uh, yeah, it, it, it manufactured lasers and. Uh, Simon had uh, well, had promised to uh, build a light source for ASML's new EUV machine, but it was very hard to to uh, well <laughs> to to get it in uh, working and to get it in production as well in in uh, high volume production. So um, uh, ASML acquired a a Simon to, um, uh, to to take this technology in its own hand and 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 make sure that uh, this won't, wouldn't be the uh, the thing stopping EUV from working because uh, the, the company had bet everything on uh, this next generation of, of, of lithography. So that's what the ASMC on the world, if I'm not wrong for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're talking about the, uh, uh, well, to, to get EUV working, uh, ASML uh, couldn't make it alone. So they really needed their uh, biggest clients. So Intel, Samsung, TSMC to join them and uh, to uh, to up the game, so to invest more in R and D, um, and they use this trick to, uh, to uh, well, they use this method of uh, asking their customers to invest in them uh, for for a short period of time, which would um, create more capital uh, to invest in EUV, and uh, they called this uh, the. Uh, well, they compare them uh, to the three musketeers. Uh, um, so these three players that had this joint uh, goal of uh, uh, creating a new uh, generation of lithography machine that would help Moore's Law uh, one, one step further. Otherwise, uh, well, we wouldn't be able to uh, have these chips that are even more advanced and, uh, for example, help us with uh, the... Uh, uh, incredible AI possibilities we have these days. So, very crucial part uh, of the uh, of the uh, history of of uh, the semiconductor industry is this. Well, this joint effort of TSMC, Samsung, and, and Intel investing in in um, uh, ASML to uh, to uh, uh, acquire uh, Symer for one, and also to uh, 
free up money for uh, investing in, in uh, uh, EUV, uh, to get EUV work because it, it's a, such an uh, incredible technology. And ASML wasn't uh, capable of doing it all by itself. It was just too expensive. So uh, this uh, Project Musketeer uh, really helped uh, uh, the, the industry uh, one step further. And uh, ASML now is the... Uh, well, the monopolist when it comes to EUV. It's a technology that's only um, uh, uh, available uh, if you buy it at, uh, at ASML. And that's uh, the reason why the company has grown to, uh, I think, a market value of almost $400 uh, billion. It's incredible for a startup just that, uh, well, had a, re- a very rough start, so to speak. And the only one who creates this, there is no competition for ASML, at least in the high end, the EUV sector. And the EUV, no, no, they're, they're monopolists uh, in that area. Right. So, like, there are Canons and Nikons as well in the industry, but still, somehow, UV proves that it is it is the superior one compared to what the multi-beam technology is. So, uh, I mean, to uh, to play a bit of a devil's advocate here, uh, the foundries, if I'm running a foundry, I'll also consider that I might diversify my suppliers as well in this. But somehow uh, the industry gets oriented towards the UV, uh, the ultraviolet, uh, the technology called the ultraviolet uh, lithography. Mm-hmm. So yes, yes. How is that working out for the industry? Uh, well, you're totally right. Uh, there's hardly any choice if you're uh, a semiconductor manufacturer and you want to uh, uh, create uh, uh, chips or uh, produce chips uh, with a, a certain. T- amount of nanometers then you need the ASML uh, equipment because their competitors can't make it uh, up to this very uh, uh, well advanced level um, but if you look at the, uh, the ecosystem of, of the semiconductor industry there's this it's a, a very valuable and very brittle chain as well so there are a lot of sole suppliers so to speak yeah. um, and uh, even in ASML's own ecosystem so Zeiss is the only supplier of their uh, okay. uh, opt- optic system, and uh, VDL is the only supplier of the wafer uh, uh, technology, wafer table. And um, for example, Trumpf, uh, who designs the laser for uh, the EV machines, is the only supplier for that. And uh, the reason um, the industry works that way is that uh, you really need to rely on each other. So these companies all know each other very well. And it's not the same practice as you see, for example, in the automotive industry, where suppliers are usually played out against each other to create a, well, better value for money. Well, this is not the game. You need the best equipment. And that's uh, the reason why semiconductor manufacturers, for example, use the best equipment they can acquire from from ASML. Uh, It doesn't mean they don't negotiate uh, about deals, of course. All these uh, economic principles uh, are, are are still very much alive, but um, uh, they have no other option to choose for other uh, uh, vendors. Hardly for the most advanced technology, they do have options for the less advanced uh, uh, technology. Then, uh, for example, Nikon is is a very good competitor. Yet, if you look at ASML's market share, share even in the less advanced systems, systems it has like. Uh, 80 plus percent of, of, of the total market right so uh let's get to what is going on right now in uh netherlands so there is a whole thing going on that yeah. ASML, is, asml is considering getting out of netherlands right now because of some not so friendly policy making of dutch government but the cabinet uh, the dutch cabinet has come up with what is known as the operation beethoven to keep it at home so what is going on there right now what's the concern that asml is facing in netherlands uh so there's no real threat of ASML le- actually leaving uh, oh, the Netherlands. Okay. It's just um, that's the way that's, that it's uh, in- interpreted uh, by the media and also by uh, our uh, national government. And that's why they, they um, created a, well, uh, a fund, so to say, uh, called Beethoven, like the famous composer. Yes. And, um, and it was a wordplay because ASML is from Veldhoven, a little town. And it also uh, uh, is very uh, next to uh, other city called Eindhoven. So Veldhoven, Eindhoven, Beethoven. And uh, all these 
well, these different parts have to work together in harmony, so to speak. So that it was the idea of the wordplay. So that's Beethoven. And Beethoven is a 2.5 billion support plan, uh, partly uh, by the national government, but also by local governments and also by the uh, local businesses around ASML. And its goal is to uh, accommodate ASML's growth because uh, the company wants to grow uh, in the Netherlands. And there's no, uh, no point in, in moving because the, the real core of the brain of ASML is still very much in this province of Brabant. And uh, uh, to move such a system would be uh, a very difficult operation. So their goal is to stay in the Netherlands to double in size because they expect the industry to grow uh, uh, between now and 2030 uh, in, in, in a rapid pace and they have to accommodate that growth. But since ASML doesn't only make, <laughs> it, it makes hardware, it, it's, it's a, so it's a physical, uh, uh, it, 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 yeah, it, it needs room to grow. And uh, in a small company like the Netherlands, uh, that uh, has a lot of uh, consequences for the people living around the the uh, the area of uh, of Veldhof, where ASML's headquarters is. So to accommodate the growth, uh, ASML is going to uh, double its uh, uh, amount of local employees from twenty thousand to uh, to forty thousand. Well, if you're from India, you must say that well, it's not a lot of uh, people, <laughs> but um, uh, for for the Dutch, it's it's quite. Uh, uh, Okay. Quite, a, quite a drastic uh, uh, move. And uh, because these people going to work there, you need the tech talent, uh, which is rare everywhere, but also in the Netherlands. And you, you need uh, uh, the suppliers to grow as well. Because, well, if you, you sell more machines, you all know, also need more components. And the suppliers uh, also need extra tech talent. So that's another stress on the educational system. And of course, there's the, 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 the mere physics. So all these people uh, need housing. Uh, uh, they need uh, their children to go to school. They need doctors, uh, restaurants, whatever. So it's a huge boost for the economy, and but also takes a, a lot of well, extra uh, roads and extra train movements, uh, uh, buses, bike lanes, of course. We love biking in the Netherlands. So uh, all these uh, things are being paid by the Beethoven project. So it's not money it goes to, uh, that goes to ASML directly. It goes to ASML's environment to uh, accommodate that, uh, well, that future doubling in size as the company expects. It might be and, the uh, biggest employer as well, ASML, within Netherlands as well. Yeah, 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 yes, 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 yes. So uh, now let's talk about the high NA, high NA UV technology. So Intel and Samsung has gotten access to the high NA, high NA UV machines, also known as the Beast. And uh, TSMC has just ordered it. Uh, so don't you think that TSMC might be late at the next innovation cycle? We will mm -hmm. also talk about the dynamics between the foundries and the ASML as well. But uh, what is going on between TSMC and ASML vis-a-vis -vis the high NA UV equipment? Well, if you look at uh, uh, HNA, of course, ASML had its launching customer, which was Intel. And uh, Intel really uh, needed that HNA machine or needs that HNA machine to work because it wants to leapfrog uh, the uh, current uh, uh, market leader, which is uh, TSMC. The only way to do that is to uh, uh, well get the machine uh, first that can create the most fine lines and, and which you could use to uh, build these uh, very advanced uh, um, uh, semiconductors but they still have to get it work and euv um, is uh, very much a thing of uh, the uh, asian countries so korea and uh, and uh, and mainly uh, taiwan have uh, really grasped that te technology intel has also about euv machines but they just recently, recently started uh, uh, manufacturing in, in high volume, um, so right. it, it's less experienced. Well, if you look at TSMC, it has a lot of experience since 2018 when they started a high uh, volume production with EUV. Um, they have acquired a lot of data, so they really know what they're doing, and the companies really specialized in getting uh, uh, the optimal result from the existing uh, 
uh, machines. So uh, that's that's the way they uh, they, they keep their uh, uh, the customers okay. happy. And um, so, uh, the uh, of course uh, Intel uh, as Intel has invested in HNA, the other uh, companies that ha have acquired EUV are also uh, investing in HNA, but their timing is different and. Uh, Intel has a tendency to buy technology too early if you compare it to the uh, competitors. So uh, TSMC is more uh, realistic, I think, and uh, it's uh, kind of postponing it to the last moment. But they, in, uh, in the end, they uh, have to uh, uh, upgrade their systems as well. And if uh, if you look at uh, what ASML is saying, uh, or listen, if you listen to what ASML is saying, then you see that um, the uh, Every customer that has acquired EUV machines, I think there are about six uh, separate uh, six clients who have done so. They all have uh, promised to uh, invest in high NA as well. Right. So uh, since you talk about the in, uh, about Intel's ambition to compete like with TSMC, I, this really intrigues me because uh, Intel itself relies on TSMC for the cutting edge nodes, and uh, it is saying that uh, I'm going to compete with TSMC in the cutting edge. So ASML is like at the, let's just say the front row seat of this whole dynamic that is going on between the Intel and uh, TSMC. So what goes in this negotiation between uh, the foundries in getting, like uh, Intel just got into the foundry business, right? It was in the IDM business before that, but now it just also wants to venture into the foundry business as well. So how mm -hmm. does that work out? Um, so, so your question is, uh, uh, how... Uh... Clever is uh, uh, Intel uh, getting into the foundry business? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I think uh, Intel has to because uh, this really uh, is about scale. So you need to, to do these huge investments in, in these fabs, uh, in these complicated uh, manufacturing processes. You need scale. Otherwise, you can't uh, ever uh, well, uh, get your CapEx uh, back. And... Uh, to, to create scale, uh, it's better to have other customers that also use the same factory so you can optimize it. And um, Intel itself, of course, is uh, not as big when it comes to it, selling its own chips uh, to the world. So uh, they have the server market and they have the PC market, uh, but they kind of lost it on mobile and they're also uh, a laggard when it comes to uh, AI chips. So they need other customers to fill their uh, fabs as well. Um, so, but it's not a company that really has a culture of, uh, of, of foundry because the foundry business is not only a business model, it's also a cultural model that you really have to uh, accommodate uh, uh, yeah. the wishes of, 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 your, of your customers and uh, not to put your own interests first. So for Intel, that's, that's quite a change, but it has to make the change. It's a huge bet for the company and the company, uh, well, it, it really knows that, but it's going to be a, a tough one for them, I think. Uh, to compete with uh, Asian companies who have uh, a, a long-standing uh, tradition uh, in this uh, kind of industry. So, uh, I mean, I I somewhat empathize with Intel and TSMC. Like, uh, it's really hard to run a foundry, to be honest. Like, to give you a perspective, Apple is a phone maker and has a market cap of what? 3.5 trillion I last said. NVIDIA, mm -hmm. uh, a fabulous chip designer, uh, stands at around 3 trillion. That is equivalent to the India's whole economy, to just give you a perspective. But TSM is a boundary leader. Uh, it is standing at the market cap of around 1.5 trillion. So you put so much in it and you might not get that much of the value proposition out of it. And the sunken costs are huge. I mean, you need government subsidization to keep a, keep a new foundry afloat. And uh, this is something that is happening in India as well, because India never had a foundry to begin with. So it makes sense that the government is investing so much in the manufacturing. But mm -hmm. to again, there's a, a whole narrative that there should be a whole ecosystem within a country. And which is kind of impractical in my opinion, because you cannot do everything in one geography. You need partners, you need alliances. And for that, you need a somewhat a globalized outlook to the thing. This is unfortunately not the case right now, given the geopolitics. Uh, so, how should policymakers uh, should uh, like strategize between bringing the designing or the manufacturing of the chips in their country? What goes behind that? Mm -hmm. But but um, if if you look at uh, the, the, I guess there's a lot of uh, well interested from uh, from the uh, 
the rest of the technology world to invest in China, uh, uh, not only in China, but also uh, in, in, uh, in uh, India when it comes to the electronics industry mm -hmm. and also the, uh, the other parts that are needed for electronics, for, uh, for example, for semiconductors. And I, I guess it's still uh, well, uh, very early days when it comes to uh, uh, developing this, uh, this ecosystem. Um, but you can't uh, just, uh, uh, you, you really need other companies uh, for, for uh, uh, semiconductor uh, industry to, to, to thrive. Otherwise you have nothing. Uh, this uh, chip industry um, or, or, or building a fab really is like a beating heart that needs a, a flow of blood. And <laughs> not a real blood, but gases. Uh, you need uh, the uh, suppliers to uh, surface water, there. electricity chemicals water yes. and, and if you look at for example at the ecosystem uh, that's in taiwan uh, or uh, that's being built recently in uh, uh, in, in, in dresden uh, in germany or in arizona where tsmc is also uh, expanding its fabs um i think the the formula that the rest of the world is is finding and I, i'm not sure if this is going to be uh, viable in india as well is you really need the expertise of these uh, uh, other companies. So, for example, Dresden is a, a, a joint venture between uh, uh, European uh, chip manufacturers, NXP, Infineon, and Bosch, uh, like the car, uh, very big in, in the automotive industry, together with TSMC. And uh, so they use the uh, knowledge and uh, the expertise of, of Taiwanese experts, and uh, they uh, use it to build a fab in uh, in in, uh, in in Europe. Be but but it's very hard to compete uh, with all the knowledge that has been gathered um, uh, in Asia, uh, especially in Korea and Taiwan. So you need these companies to cooperate with you and uh, uh, share their knowledge and uh, build joint ventures and. Uh, for example, uh, uh, use that model uh, to uh, create a foundry industry in, in, in India. Right. So, does it make sense? Yeah, <laughs> yes, it does. It does. So since you said that there is a lot of uh, integrations between the supply, between the end users of these chips, and this is the same thing that is happening in India. So mm -hmm. there is a fab going on right now. A fab is getting developed in Dolera. It is in my home state, Gujarat. And uh, uh, it is a joint partnership between the Tata uh, the Tata Semiconductors, if you are aware of oh, the yeah. Tata yeah. conglomerate. So Tata is partnering with PSMC of Taiwan. So P PSMC is giving their technology to uh, to, uh, to Tata in 20 nanometer rings. And mm. Tata already has an established downstream business. It is also in automotives, it is also in software, it is also in hardware manufacturing. Like Most of the iPhones that are manufactured in India are through Tata and Foxconn. These are the two biggest suppliers of iPhone in India. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. So it makes sense for them to invest this much in uh, Feb right now, uh, like 91,000 crore. Uh, that is almost uh, $10 billion. So Tata yeah. is putting that much of its money there and 70% of that is subsidized by the government and for the right reason. So yes, uh, the whole thing is really interesting when you see it from the broader perspective. And uh, I I'm just interested that who will get the lithography contract for this web that is developing in here. So there were some reports that ASML is in negotiations, but uh, the Japan there was a Japanese delegation that also uh, visited there as well. So let's mm -hmm. see what happens there. I'm really excited. Uh if, if you refer to ASML, you, you see the company is expanding everywhere, and it's uh, mainly expanding everywhere where the uh, their customers are building fabs. So if their customers are building fabs in India, and ASML will be there as well. And um, so uh, I, their I, foot footprint is just growing along with their customers. I look forward to getting ASML in India. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I promised you around one hour and I won't take much of that time. And uh, really again, thank you for doing this. And uh, so my last question to you is that uh, you have a very extensive experience for spanning more than a decade in the journalism, specifically mm -hmm. the tech journalism. And there are many of our young viewers who also want to make it big in such a field, maybe in tech journalism or anywhere else. So what career advice or life lesson will you give to our viewers? We ask this question to everyone. And uh, we are really interested in this answer. Well, okay. Well, I think that's a, a very interesting question because 
uh, when I started this uh, project, I never realized this would end up in a book, uh, by the way. I just uh, stumbled across uh, this company that was kind of obscure, and uh, I was intrigued by the technology and also intrigued by the people in their stories. And uh, because they have, ASML has kind of a cowboy culture and a startup culture, even though it's a multinational now, it's still ingrained in the company that, that they had a, rare, a very rough start and had to improvise a lot. And um, so for me, it was just nice to hop on board and to look behind the scenes for about uh, three years and uh, uh, really get to know the uh, the leadership and the and the spirit of the of the, the the company. So my lesson was if you well, it's actually in the title of the book, which is called Focus. Okay. If you uh, uh, focus yourself on one subject, and you can uh, uh, actually achieve more uh, in the end than. Uh, spreading your attention uh, across a lot of other subjects. And if you look at techno, uh, uh, tech journalists in general, that's also uh, the, uh, the way I started, was, well, you, you have this uh, 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 huge pile of uh, different subjects you all want, uh, you all want to, uh, uh, well, cover. And uh, it's really not the best investment of time. And my lesson was, uh, if you invest specialize your, uh, your subject and uh, invest a lot of time to go uh, to take this deep dive and really do your research and uh, go look for extra sources, try to find the, uh, the extra things that are hidden uh, behind the scenes and it pays off in the end. And that's what I've experienced uh, with this book. Right. So Mark, again, thank you very much for doing this. And I hope I can host you again for another podcast like this. We can deep dive into the different subjects as well within the semiconductor industry. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Right.